Well, I got this grizzly home. You know, this is the one my brother gave me. So I got no money into it. Uh, but it's been interesting tearing it apart. Uh, the, the actual problem, you know, it was using oil. As you can see, there's scoring on a piston skirt on what would have been the top. Uh, top ring is still free. Second ring is stuck. Actually, the oil ring is still free. But, you know, that's not repairable or not usable. Uh, it actually, you know, it's funny because, like I said, the top ring is good because it still had a lot of compression. But, and when it warmed up, it would use oil. Not a lot, but it would, and it was a little noisy. Well, when you get scoring like that, you get noise. The cylinder itself actually isn't too bad. Uh, very, very minor scoring, but it would have to be bored out to reuse it. You know, you'd have to go to the first oversize. And I will hang on to this cylinder, but I do have the Chinese one that I will put in there, which would be cheaper than going <laughs> the regular route. But it's been interesting working on it. Um, it really got that motor buried in there. It's, it's very well built, I would say, but uh, very over-engineered. Uh, I guess most things tend to be that way now. Uh, it's in a lot of ways a motor similar to my 500 Yamahas. You know, I can see where the design evolved from that. But then they had to go and do this, uh, what seems to me to be excessive five valve head. And you can see there's a little carbon on there. I have not decided if I'm going to grind the valves on this head yet. I'll probably fill it up with diesel fuel and just see if it leaks any out. But I don't know that it would be necessary to re-grind them. The one thing I would say that I don't like to see, I mean, as over-engineered as this is, then they go and do a deal, something that other people have done, and Yamaha or Honda has been doing it for a long time, where they run the camshaft directly into the aluminum head. There's no bearings. You know, if you tear out the camshaft, you uh, take the head out. You know, that's where, like, my 500s, you've got big ball bearings that they run on. But they went this route. Um, not... Well, I, I guess, you know, actually even a new head, a Chinese head, is like maybe a hundred dollars, so I guess it would be no big fatal deal. But it just seemed like it was unnecessary. You know, it would have been a lot better to have a better bearing surface than aluminum. Aluminum is marginal at best. You know, you used to see that with Honda motors, where it would take out that bearing surface. You know, and then they got this exotic rocker arm arrangement. But no wear really on the cam. Um, though I was a little concerned because he wasn't very particular about what he ran for oil in this. You know, pretty much uh, oil is oil. But, uh, you know, it helps that it's liquid cooled, but the problem uh, when I took this thing apart, there was very little water in it. She's been running, she's been running hot, and I think that's what took the piston out. But like I say, that cam runs directly in the head. Now, when I took this apart, 
I couldn't figure out one thing. You know, when I pulled the cam drive sprocket off, here's this. Uh, it looks like an advanced mechanism. Well, it's part of their <laughs> decompressor. You know, like on my 500, you have to pull that knob on the handlebars, and that allows you to kick that over. Well, on this, they've got it automatically built in to drop the compression by this advanced mechanism when it's not spinning over at any speed. It actually pops a little ball bearing up that pushes on a rocker arm and opens a valve, you know, to drop that compression down. Just a weird way to do it, but I kind of wondered because this thing is always, uh, you know, it starts finding an electric starter, but I know that one time I tried to pull it over, it's got a recoil starter. And man, that's nearly impossible with that recoil starter. Uh, it seems to me even pointless having it on there. You know, it, it just, you weren't going to start it with that. But the electric will spin it over, and it's because of that decompressor. So well, that works. But like I say, I've got the Chinese cylinder and the Chinese piston that I will put in. And that'll work. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to grind the valves or not. Like I said, I'll check on that. Because the one thing I don't have on hand are the valve seals. And if you're going to grind the heads, you really should replace the valve seals. So I, I really don't think I will unless I can see that I actually got a leak in there. Uh, though the adjusters were I set the hair on the tight side, but no, I can see owning one of these, I think, uh, for a normal person would be an expensive proposition, and I think maybe that's why a lot of these don't get the regular maintenance done on them, because I really don't know what they would charge you to, uh, like, set the valves because they got this motor so buried in there, you have to take a heck of a lot of stuff off, all plastic, but you've got to take that all off to get to the point where you can actually adjust the valves. And even then, you know, like the exhaust valves are way back under, uh, I don't know, it's all touchy-feely kind of stuff. So, She's not designed for easy maintenance. I suspect a lot of these just get run into the ground. Like this one pretty much was, you know, it was like when they say about horses, ridden hard and put up wet. So this is ridden hard and put up dry because there, was, there wasn't a cup of water in that damn uh, cooling system. So basically it was cooling with the oil and like I say, the oil was marginal. But just very hard to get at things. Uh, it's a tremendous pile of plastic I had to take off. And it's the first time I run into these. Everything is held on with these little plastic clips. You know, where it goes in and then you pop this down, it expands and that locks it in. That's what holds all this plastic garbage on. Well, I don't think they're designed to be a one-time use thing, but uh, they invariably end up being that. I think there's about maybe a half dozen of them that didn't break apart trying to get them out of there. You know, I don't know why, you know, you don't use a nut and bolt like a normal human being, but I think they're quick to assemble. You, you know, pop, 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 you know, so I guess that's where they use them in the manufacturing. But I think if you go to service one, you'd have to replace a lot of that stuff. 
So them I don't have on hand, so I had to order some of them. And not uncommon, I guess they use them on all cars now, or held together that same way. But like say, even, like I say, there was very little water in this thing. There is a overflow reservoir that sits on the outside, but they have a lot of faith in that because the radiator up front is absolutely buried under all that plastic. You have to take off the bracks, you have to undo a bunch of wiring, uh, and there's a lot of wiring on this thing. It is not a simple design. It's funny, you know, the thing can't weigh a lot because it's just a very uh, minimal skeletal type frame, then a whole lot of plastic. The motor is completely covered with plastic. Not really made to be serviced. And there were things like, uh, well, okay. This is the exhaust, and of course buried in there. And it had a heat shield that ran all the way back, aluminum heat shield. Well, that thing was all wore out, you know, the vibration, and it slopped around on there and made a horrendous racket. I think a lot of the noise when it was running was coming from that exhaust shield. So I'll have to do some modifying with that. And I think what I'm probably going to do before I put that shield on is wrap the exhaust with that fiberglass header tape. That will quiet it down some. And it will also uh, kind of give something for that heat shield to sit against. But I'm going to have to do a lot of uh, washers and stuff to make that heat shield work. But with all this plastic, the heat has got to be shielded or you melt the thing down. And like here, now the exhaust runs right underneath a plastic panel, which is underneath your plastic gas tank. I tell you, if one of these things caught on fire, it would just be a, a pool of melted plastic with the sprinklings of aluminum. But it was running, you know, like I say, when I got it up here, I loaded it and unloaded it, it run fine. Uh, like I say, a little noisy and used a little oil. But that's understandable. Actually, um, not as bad as I expected it to be, or as it could have been. Because the one thing I was relieved to find out, you can actually pull the top end off of these in the frame because it is different from like my 500 engines they use studs that come up well you can't clear the studs now this uses bolts that go down makes it a little easier for maintenance uh, it would be nice it would actually be a thought to convert those 500 cases to that so that you could pull your top end without having to pull the whole thing apart and pull the motor off, so they ain't that hard to work on compared to this monstrosity. Because even now, I noticed the tail light is broken. Well, no normal company would put, you know, two screws, hold your tail light lens, you take it off, put it on. I can see I'm going to end up taking the rack off the back, this whole big piece of plastic, which involves your battery box and a whole lot of wiring have to get that out of the way so that I can actually get to the tail light to put the lens in. You know, there's a simpler way of doing stuff like that. But a lot of times, like I say, over-engineered, the idea is make them, you know, they design them so that they're easy to put together from the factory in certain steps. You know, things pop together. But then, in order to service everything, you have to unpop everything. And you're dealing with them little fasteners. But I think I can go ahead and put the, uh, the new piston and cylinder on, and I'll, I'll put some 
diesel fuel in that head and see if it leaks down. Uh, though, like I say, it had a tremendous amount of compression. But it's interesting. But I don't know how, um, you know, everybody has got four wheelers. Now, maybe, like these Polaris ones, like what my brother has got now, maybe they aren't as bad to service. Maybe they're not as overly designed as what these are. I mean, it's a nice machine. It's a brute of a machine. But you could not afford to bring one to get serviced. I don't know. Uh, the cost would just be outrageous because it takes too much time to get at anything on them. You know, it's just all this plastic covering everything. So I'm going to have to look at that, that Polaris he's got now and see if that is going to be one of them that's difficult to service to because he was thinking he's got like 500 miles on that. He was thinking, oh, I should bring it in and to the dealer and have them do a, a service on it, oh, which is a, not a bad idea, but he's thinking, ah, maybe it'd be a couple hundred bucks. I don't know that you're going to get out of there, out of there for under a thousand. I, I got the feeling that these things could be uh, very expensive to service. Just from what I see, you know, there's and it does, you know, like I say, like I had to pull the whole front end off before you could even get at the radiator. I, I don't know why you don't have a door in the hood, you know, in that front cowling over the radiator cap so that you could actually open it up and get at the radiator cap. But no, you got to tear it completely apart. And then even when I took that cowling off, in order to remove it, I had to take and uh, disconnect a hundred wires. You know, there's there's all kinds of wiring harnesses that run through it. They didn't have to. I mean, they could have made it in a way that it would have been fairly easy to take it off without disconnecting them. But they made it in such a way that they're routed through the iron cowling, so you actually have to disconnect them. I mean, they're all basic this, you know, gang connectors, uh, and they're all different that you can't get them confused, but it just seems like it would be a lot better if you didn't have to go digging them apart every time. And every time I see something that has that much electronic stuff in it, and that many connectors, uh, to me, I always think there is a potential for a problem to come from just a bad connection. There's just too many places things can go wrong. And things that could be quite serious. You know, I, I know he had said, when I asked him about it, he said, well, the heat gauge hasn't worked for quite a while. There's a hot light that, in theory, comes on, but it was on all the time. I mean, from the moment you turned the key on, it was on, but I found where that wire had disconnected from the sending unit. So that was a fault there, though I did buy a new sending unit because the parts aren't that expensive. It's just that everything is tough to get at. You know, you look at the machine, even when you take the side panels off, you still you can't really get at anything. Even the oil filter is buried back in there. But that's a bad thing that you can't get at the radiator. You know, that you're counting on that overflow that, you know, and I don't trust them on cars. I certainly don't trust them on something like this. You know, you should be able to open a radiator cap. But not on this, not without disassembling half the machine. But, uh, like I say, I won't have much into it. Uh, maybe a couple hundred all said and done. But it is a brute of a machine and is well designed, it's just over designed. You know, I think they made a smaller uh, 
version of the Yamaha ones that is actually air-cooled, and I could see that would simplify things greatly, because here you've got hoses running everywhere. You know, real sending units and some things I really have no idea what they are. <laughs> uh, actually, even a lot of air ducting. Now, I suspect that this there's one in the front of the motor, but I think that's to cool the uh, belt drive because it is an ultramatic. You know, it's high and low range and then kind of like a snowmobile with a belt in there. Oh, this thing too, it had, you know, it had uh, a belly pan, a three-piece belly pan made out of plastic, of course, underneath. Well, you know, he'd been using this thing, checking cattle and herding cattle and whatnot in cornfields, you know, in corn stubble. The hole underneath, even after he pressure washed it, was jammed completely full of mud and corn stalks and then baked in there. Yeah, I was going to change the oil, I couldn't even find the drain plug on it. It was buried under... Uh, there, there was at least a bushel of corn stalks I pulled out from underneath and mud. No, I won't have that problem. And I guess it's good to have that, that skid pan underneath so you don't, you know, jam a stick into something important. But there's a lot to it. It, it you know, it just seems a bit much in a way. But it would be a good machine, but I really wonder, uh, you know, how people can afford uh, to, to drive these things you know, because they're all over. Everybody's got these things. Every farmer has got one, and there's kids tearing up down the road all the time on them. Well, somebody has got to service them at some time, and God, that's got to cost a lot of money. You know, I, I just can't imagine. Well, I'd be curious to see what he ends up paying to have that, that first service on that machine that he's got now. But it can't be any worse than this as far as getting at, like, to set the valves and that sort of thing. Because this, you know, like I said, you got to tear a whole bunch of plastic off to get anywhere near where you can get at the valves. Yeah. But that's where it stands. Then I'll maybe go out there tonight while well, i got to clean parts up and I'll put some diesel fuel in that head and see where I'm going with that. Because i got everything I need to do it except the valve seals. And I don't know if I want to uh, break them open unless I have to. But at least I found the problem. And I know what caused it was, uh, was no water. Uh, that and a combination of uh, pretty crappy oil. But I think, uh, I really I have the feeling that these things just get driven into the ground and then parked. Uh, I don't know that they even take them on trades. Because if you took this in on trade, you would have had to do a hell of a lot of work on it before you could sell it again. You know, I, I don't know. I know there isn't a lot of used ones for sale. I, I really think they just get driven into the ground. But I'll be curious to find out what the service actually costs him. But I got the feeling, you know, he was guessing 200. I'm thinking it's going to be a lot closer to a grand. But, like this one, probably should have had that kind of a service done like two years ago, maybe. I mean, he's had it for a while now. 
and he bought it used, gently used, let's say. It was an old guy that owned it. Can't always go by that, though. A lot of times it will be an old guy who owns it, but grandkids have been out tearing around with it, so you can't always go by who the owner was. I think there's going to be a lot of these turn up. Uh, particularly now, um, I don't know if these are as popular now as the the side-by-side -side ones. Uh, I mean, the ranchers want, you know, four-wheel this, this play and thing like this. But there's a lot of people that spend a lot of money buying those bigger ones. And it could be that maybe those bigger ones, you know, them side-by-side -side ones, are a little easier to work on. They appear to actually have some sort of a hood arrangement. So maybe you can get at the motor. Because that thing was just ridiculously buried in there. <laughs> but it'll go back together. And I, I'd have to say, you know, I'm sure it will be a good machine for my users, but only because I can work on it. For a normal person, uh, I just think the cost would be outrageous to have them. Uh, you would be afraid to run it for fear you'd have to have it worked on. Well, it's interesting. Um, for me, not so difficult to work on, only because it's, uh, you know, like I say, it's really the motor is kind of based on what my 500s are. Uh, the layout of the parts is kind of the same, and you know, so it's not a big mystery. It's just not as simple. If you had this frame and this drivetrain, and somehow convert it to put one of my 500 motors in there, I think you might have something. I should probably keep an eye open if I ever run across. I got extra 500 motors, but this is all shaft drive. Now, say if you had the chain drive, would be an easier conversion. But I think you could make a hell of a machine then, and completely avoid the the water cooling. You know, if you you could get plenty of airflow through there. Um, obviously, it wasn't. Uh, it was oil cooling is what it was doing now because there was no water in it. So it had to be just the uh, the oil that was keeping it from getting any worse than it did. But it does not surprise me at all that this piston is scored up. Um, considering what I what I saw when I tried to drain the water out of it. But to bury something like that, a pretty vital piece and then absolutely bury it. You know, I, I don't see the sense of that, but I guess maybe if you didn't have all the racks on, it would have made it a little easier, because this had racks and a bumper, uh, you know, maybe a step down more model wouldn't be so bad. But God, I mean, how hard is it to put a little door to open up to get at your radiator cap. Now I was beginning to wonder where the hell a radiator was because I couldn't, you know, looking at it, you couldn't see the damn thing. It's buried. But the whole drive seems to be in good. There's no ripped up TV boots or anything. You know, it's all, it's a solid. I'm sure it must have been an expensive machine when it was new because it has to be like the top of the Yamaha line. But she has been neglected. But good thing, you know, like I say, I, I've got that piston and cylinder on hand. And that'll be a test of the uh, Chinese. But, uh, you know, like I said, I, I, I do feel that the Chinese have got their their aftermarket replacement parts. They've got the metallurgy down. That doesn't seem to be a problem. 
where they run into, you know, like every kind of little sensor or carburetor or wiring connector. That they just cheap out on that stuff, and that's what kills them. But if you're just replacing a big chunk of metal, I think it's all right. I think that'll be fine. But we'll find out. I guess it'll be a good test of Chinese yam.